Today's podcast is sponsored by NetSuite, the easy-to-use cloud-based business management software for every aspect of your business. Now through April 15th, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to netsuite.com slash gold. I see a timer. I don't hear anything. All right. Apparently, I am live. Sorry about the delay. We had some technical difficulties, and apparently those technical difficulties haven't even been ironed out yet, but uh, hopefully I am talking and everybody is listening. Well, today was a big day to cap a big week, and by big, I I guess I really mean significant. Um, You know, there's an old Wall Street saying, nobody rings a bell, meaning that nobody, you know, warns you when you're at a major top or a major bottom. The problem is there are bells. It's just that people don't recognize them. They don't hear them. They don't know what to listen for. Well, there was a a big bell rung today uh, in in the gold market, in the silver market. And everybody's tone deaf. They, They don't hear it or it's falling on deaf ears. But this is very significant. Now, the price of gold rose almost $40 today, uh, $37.60, it looks like to be exact, closing at a new all-time record high of 2328 That high won't last long. I would imagine we'll break it uh, on Monday. S- Silver finally woke up from its slumber this week and outshined gold, up $0.55 cents at $27. 41. To give you an idea of the size of the gain this week in gold and silver, gold rose 4% on the week, which is a big move for gold in one week. Silver rose 10%, two and a half times the rise in gold. Now, I've been pounding the table on this podcast, getting people buy silver, buy silver. I mentioned I bought some more silver for myself just like a week ago, uh, 24 and change. You know, now it's 20, you know, 27 and change, headed to 30, headed to 50. I think we're moving up quick. I don't think it's going to be long before silver makes a new high. Now, gold's going to keep on making new highs. Now, the gold and silver mining stocks had big weeks, but nothing, I think, compared to what's coming. The uh, GDX was up 7% on the week, and the GDXJ uh, was up 8%. At one point, interday today, it was up 9%, but it, it, it had a little bit of a pullback towards you know the, the end of the day. But you know, I was watching on CNBC, they were talking about the markets. They barely mentioned gold. I mean, they're mentioning it a little bit now, and I'll get into that. But they, you know, they talked about the energy sector. There was some host on, and he said, well, let's turn our attention to energy because that's the top uh, performing sector on the week, it's up 4%. Now, I like energy. Energy is my second biggest position personally, next to precious metals mining. But they didn't even mention because energy is not the best performing sector, unless you don't even consider the precious metals mining companies a sector. I guess they don't. They don't even care because precious metals mining stocks were up way more than oil stocks. And of course, oil went up. I mean, oil uh, went above uh, 87 today. Brent got above 91. These are five, six month highs. Uh, Oil prices are up uh, 22% this year, right? And I'm going to talk more about that when I talk about inflation, but not that, you know, oil wasn't significant, but really it pales in comparison to what happened in gold and it got no coverage whatsoever. Now, these stocks are finally positive on the year. But if you compare gold mining stocks to the price of gold and silver, these things are going to move. You know, nobody is talking about them. Nobody is recommending them. That firm that downgraded Newmont Mining a month ago uh, hasn't upgraded it yet. I remember I talked about it. I bought Newmont Mining the day they downgraded. I bought more the next day and the day after that. You know, I hadn't even intended on buying more of the stock, but, you know, 
I couldn't help it. You know, I already had a lot of it, but when I saw that ridiculous downgrade and it's selling, I bought, I was buying a lot more stocks for myself. I bought more Barrick Gold when they downgraded Barrick. I mean, it, they downgraded all these stocks at the lows. I mean, Newmont is up like 30 something percent since that, since that downgrade, but they've yet to upgrade it. No brokerage firm has come out and said, buy a gold stock. This is still a stealth bull market. There's plenty of time to buy. Now, I would be buying more right now if I hadn't just bought so much more. But if you haven't, you know, topped up your positions, do it, right? At, when, when gold was at $2,000 an ounce, I said, this is the floor. So just buy it because there's very little risk because there's not much downside. Well, now that we're at 2300 there may be a little bit more risk, but I don't think so. I think there's very little risk. That's my opinion. In gold, I just see very limited downside in gold and silver, and therefore I see limited downside in these mining stocks. But I see massive upside in these stocks. Look at a long term chart of these stocks, they are still dirt cheap. You can barely see this 30% rally. And if you buy it now, you're still buying these stocks a lot cheaper than people who bought them a year ago or two years ago. I know that's not going to be the case much longer, I don't think. I think we're going to see much bigger weeks than the week we had this week. So I think you just buy. So gold and silver, I know the guys that shift gold, they're going to work this weekend. Uh, the phones are ringing more. They're getting busier, but they're not nearly as busy as they should be. And the premiums, I bought some of these silver eagles and the premiums are still low. I expect the premiums to blow out on these coins because I think they're going to run out because all of a sudden there's going to be a rush. So those are two things when you're buying uh, uh, silver coins and gold. It's not just the price of the metal. It's the premium on the coins when you know there's a lot of demand and they haven't, they haven't minted them. So I know they'll work over the weekend at Shift Gold. Just go to our website, shiftgold.com. And any gold and silver that you are planning on buying, just buy it. Stop waiting for a pullback. Right? You're going to be waiting for Godot. Right? Just get in there and buy. And even more particular with the mining stocks. You want to buy these gold mining stocks. You want to buy the Euro Pacific Gold Fund. You can buy it no load pretty much anywhere except the major wirehouses. Uh, you shouldn't even be working with those guys anyway. Uh, but contact the guys at, at you know, at, um, at, at Euro Pacific Asset Management. The numbers on the website, you know, these, it's amazing that you can still buy these stocks this cheap. They, I don't think this sale is going to be going on much longer, especially given what happened today uh, with gold and, and, and wh why. And you have to look at the whole day today with gold. And so it started with the jobs report, which we got today. We get the first Friday pretty much of, of every month. And so we get the, uh, the, the jobs report for March. And the consensus was 200,000 jobs created. We came out with 303,000. 50% more than they expected, higher than the higher range, which was 230,000. They did revise the prior month lower, but only by 5,000. Not a big revision like we've been used to. They went from 275 to 270. So a big report. And the unemployment rate fell from 3.9 to 3.8. And the labor force participation went up from 62.5 to 62.7. So this is what Wall Street considers a very strong report. Now, I know it's another BS report. All these jobs, net, are part-time jobs. Look at the jobs. Almost 70% of them are government jobs. They are healthcare jobs. And a lot of healthcare jobs are really government jobs in disguise. And, you know, Food and beverage, hospitality, waiters, bartenders, hotel maids, that kind of stuff, right? That's where the jobs are. We had no creation of manufacturing jobs at all. Uh, and last month's loss of manufacturing jobs, which was originally reported at minus 4,000, was revised to minus 10,000. So the jobs that we need to reduce our trade deficit, those are disappearing. The jobs we're creating are going to uh, widen. Our trade deficits. So these are not the productive jobs, but Wall Street looks at these jobs. 
uh, reports, and they just look at it at face value. And the programs, the algorithms that they that, that trade all this, right? This is what they've been programmed to do. So as soon as this stronger than expected number came out, just like Pavlov's dog, right? These uh, programs sold gold. So gold initially went down, but it didn't stay down because the real money, the real buyers came in and bought what the programs were selling. And then gold just spiked because this is a real move. The real gold buyers don't care about these jobs reports. They probably realize that they're BS. They don't care how many second and third jobs you know, broke Americans are forced to take because they can't pay their bills. They don't care about all this. They're buying gold. Bond prices got clobbered again today to end a horrific week for bonds, get, setting up a bloodbath. The yield on the 10-year now back up to 4.38. And on the 30-year, we're 4.53. So we're now closer to 5% than 4%. Pretty soon, we'll be closer to 6% than 5%. Now, in the past several years, gold got killed when yields went up. Gold got killed on a strong jobs report. Not now. Gold went up. That's why I don't think there's much risk in the gold trade. Because believe me, if we had a weak jobs report, gold would have been up a lot more than $37. So in my opinion, it doesn't matter what the numbers are. Gold's going up no matter what. It's just that it'll go up even more on weak economic news than on strong economic news. But whatever the news is, gold is going up. Gold is being repriced. Central banks are increasing their gold reserves. They don't care. They don't care about the Fed at this point. They don't care how many rate cuts we're going to get this year. They don't even care if we get any rate cuts this year. None of it matters. Gold is going up no matter what. Now, the only thing that I think could cause the price of gold to go down is if the Fed hikes rates. And I think the probability of that is practically zero. I'm not, it's not zero because obviously anything can happen. And the Fed should raise rates. But I don't think they will, especially with an election coming up this year. You know, And the longer they wait to raise rates, the more damage it'll do uh, to the Biden cap when they do hike rates uh, or to the markets, I don't think they're going to hike rates. And so as long as the market knows that, that um, Powell's not going to hike rates, then just keep buying gold because inflation is going up. And if inflation is going up, that means real rates are going down. So if the Fed just stays where it is and um, and inflation keeps picking up speed, which it's doing, and the Fed's going to do nothing about it, well, that's going to erode confidence in the dollar. That's going to erode the value of the dollar. Plus, you know, we're on autopilot on the deficit spending. The sky's the limit. They keep passing new spending. Nobody cares about uh, cutting government spending. Biden doesn't care. Trump doesn't care. Uh, and so the holders of dollars are getting out and they're getting into gold. Uh, and this trend is going to accelerate. That's why I'm saying there's very little downside risk uh, as far as I'm concerned, yet there's massive upside potential. So this can't last. The prices can't stay this low much longer. Anyway, I got a lot more to talk about on inflation and the Fed. Got a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Here's some quick math. The less your business spends on operations, on multiple systems, on delivering your products or services, the more margin you have and the more money you keep. But with higher expenses on materials, employees, distribution, and borrowing, everything costs more. So to reduce costs and headaches, smart businesses are graduating to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, HR into one platform and one 
source of truth. With NetSuite, you'll reduce IT costs because NetSuite lives in the cloud with no hardware requirement access from anywhere. You cut the cost of maintaining multiple systems because you've got one unified business management suite. You improve efficiency by bringing all major business processes into one platform, slashing manual tasks and errors. Over 37,000 companies have already made the move. So do the math. See how you'll profit with NetSuite. Now through April 15th, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to netsuite.com slash gold. All right, so I want to talk about the elephant in the room, which is inflation, that everybody is ignoring except the people who are buying gold. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that now CNBC, they do mention gold, you know, but just casually, they don't make a big deal about it. Hey, gold's going up. And every discussion about gold, they say, well, it must be because of the geopolitical situation. That must be driving gold. That's the assumption they make. I mean, they're clueless. They don't even want to consider for a minute that gold is going up because of inflation, because the rate cuts are a mistake, right? Because their rosy scenario of a soft landing and rate cuts and 2% inflation is all a pipe dream, right? They don't, they don't want to admit that. So they're trying to figure out why gold is going up because they want to hold on to this myth that they believe in. Uh, which is great because as long as they have no idea why the price of gold is going up, right, it can keep going up. Uh, and they're certainly not advising their viewers to buy it. They had nobody really coming on. They had people coming on. Anthony Papiano on again today talking about Bitcoin. Hey, where was Bitcoin this week? Right? I mentioned gold up 4%, silver up 10%. Well, the Bitcoin ETFs were all down um, 5% on the week. I mean, why is gold, Bitcoin going down if it's digital gold? Why did it drop 5% when real gold was up 4%? I mentioned on my last podcast, Bitcoin never made a new high in gold. And you know what? It probably never will. It's probably downhill from here when it comes to gold. And again, silver was up 10%, right? That's the new Bitcoin or, or maybe uh, mining stocks. Micro strategy, the poster stock for the Bitcoin mania down 16% on the week, right? This thing is imploding because I think what's going to happen soon is a lot of the people who bailed out of gold at 2,000, at 2,100, at 2,200, when we get to maybe 2,500, which we could be at very quickly, they're going to want to buy their gold back. They're going to have, you know, seller's remorse on gold and buyer's remorse on these Bitcoin ETFs. So they're going to want to go out, or maybe they're going to want to buy some gold and silver stocks that they sold so much lower. And so a lot of people that got into Bitcoin ETFs, they're going to try to get out. Operative word is try, because they can't, not without crashing the market. You see, when all this buying came into the Bitcoin ETFs, there was plenty of Bitcoin to sell, right? The, the physical, the people who own the actual Bitcoin, right? It's not physical, but they own the spot Bitcoin. They sold to the ETF buyers. So now what is it? Three, four, five percent. I'm not sure, but a large percent of all the Bitcoin that exists are now sitting in these ETFs in very weak hands, right? They're not diamond hands. These are paper thin. And I think when all of a sudden they want to get out, you're not going to find real buyers in the spot market at these prices. Maybe, you know, 20,000, 10,000, someplace down there. Some people will step up and buy, but you're not going to find people dumb enough in the real market uh, to pay these high prices like all the all the newbies did when they got into these uh, ETFs. So they're not going to be able to buy the gold stocks, right? Or they're going to be able to buy, you know, a much smaller percentage because the gold stocks they sold maybe will be up 50 percent or 100 percent. And the Bitcoin they bought is going to be down 50 percent, maybe more. So they're going to have a fraction of what they started with. They should have stayed in place, uh, but they got suckered into, you know, changing horses midstream. And now, you know, they're going to have to pay the price. But getting back to what I was talking about um, on, on inflation, look at the CRB. I put a chart up. Uh, I, you know, go to my Twitter and just scroll down and see the CRB. We're up now 17% on the year. 
it was flat last year. Same thing with oil. Oil was down 10% last year. It's up 22% this year, and we're only a quarter of the way through. How can anybody look at that and think we're going to have lower inflation in 2024 than we had in 2023? 2023, with oil down 10% and commodities flat, the CPI was up 4.1. In 2024, commodities are soaring. Oil is soaring. Do you really think we're going to have lower CPI? Of course not. It's going up. It's going in the other direction. The Fed should be hiking rates, but they can't. As I said, they'll cause a financial crisis. So they're not. So they have to come up with an excuse as to why they're not raising rates. So they keep talking about how inflation is contained, that they still think it's coming down. They're just not quite sure yet. They need a little bit more evidence. All the evidence shows that inflation is going up. So it's all BS. They're sticking to their script. That's why I said they're not going to hike rates. I mean, if the Fed hiked rates, it would be the biggest admission of a mistake. Because if the Fed hikes rates, what does that mean? That means everything they've been saying about how they believe rate cuts will be appropriate, uh, when are they going to start, all this stuff, they were wrong. They were completely wrong. If they hike rates, because they never talked about hiking rates, they never said that was a possibility. They all said it looks like we're going to be cutting rates because inflation is contained. We just want a little more proof, right, before we before we do it, right? If they end up hiking rates, that is a major, major admission that they got it wrong. But not only did they get it wrong by signaling to the markets that rate cuts were coming, they got it wrong by stopping the rate hikes. If they end up hiking rates in a month or two or three, that'll be a lot less effective than had they hiked them months ago. They should have kept on hiking. And so if they go back with a hike, Again, the markets, I don't even know if that's going to work. I mean, I think gold will go up if they hike rates, but it's possible it'll go down. But it might even go up because of the credibility that the Fed is going to lose. And of course, they won't hike rates enough, right? A quarter point, big deal, right? If inflation is back at 7 8% and the Fed goes up a quarter point, that's nothing. I think to really damage gold, they're going to have to raise a couple hundred base points. They're going to have to make up for all the hikes that they didn't have, right? Because they stopped. They were moving more slowly. They needed more hikes. We probably need 8%, 9%. Who the hell knows, right? An extra quarter is a spit in the ocean. Um, but the Fed is not going to do this. I just can't see it happening. They're not going to pull the rug out from the markets. I mean, the markets can handle, okay, the rate cuts are coming a little later. As long as they know they're coming, right? As long as they know they're going to get their heroin, they're, they're kind of okay for now. But you tell them they're not getting it. We're raising rates. The market's going to tank. <laughs> and that's going to tank Biden too. And so they're not going to do that. So that's just, you know, it, you, you got a clear path. They're, they're waving the flags, right? Like the in baseball, like the coach is waving you to run home, right? They, the, the outfielder dropped the ball, right? You're going to score, right? I mean, uh, Powell is basically waving you in to buy gold, sell dollars, buy silver, right? <laughs> buy these, buy these mining stocks. Um, you know, a lot of people still think, oh, you know, Schiff, he's, you know, gold is still only 2,300. I mean, he's gold stocks. Yeah, all that's true, right? You can still say that I'm not right because gold's not high enough. Gold stocks aren't high enough. That's fine. I'm willing to wait a few more months. <laughs> where I can have a victory lap, right? I'm not, no, I know, right. You know, my gold stocks still haven't beaten the S&P over the last five or 10 years. I'll wait a while and then they will. Right? At some point, I'm convinced that I'm right because everything that I've been forecasting is happening. And all my critics, everything they've been saying, they, they got it all wrong. They don't even realize how wrong they got it. But another thing I wanted to say about the CRB because you look at that chart that I put up there. Between 2004 and 2008, we had this big run in the CRB. And during that time, I mean, in fact, actually going back earlier, but gold actually went up 5x from 2004, you know, or maybe 2002, because it was under 400 and it went to 1900. Two, that was by 2011. I think by 2008, it was only at 1,000. 
but that was still more than a triple. You know, if gold does another move similar to the 2000 to 2011, and if you look at a chart, to me, that looks like it's going to do that. Gold's going to be $20,000, I mean, $10,000. It's a 5X move. Gold moving from 400 to 1900, actually below 400, that's the same thing percentage wise as gold going from 2000 to 10,000. So it can be done. It can happen. I think it will happen. And the Dow, I think, is going to go down. You know, people are excited today. Hey, the Dow's up 300 points. Yeah, that's 0.8%. Gold was up 1.7%. That means in real terms, the Dow was down. In fact, year to date, even though the Dow is up 3%, gold is up 13%. So the Dow is down 10% in terms of gold. I think it's at 16.75 ounces. I think it's going down to two ounces, maybe lower. You know, because the all-time record low is around one ounce, where we have a double bottom in 1932 and 1980, approximately. Maybe it was 81 or 82, but right around there. Uh, so, you know, there's a massive bear market that's going to happen in the Dow, stealth bear market in gold. Whether it has a bear market in paper dollars doesn't even matter. What matters is what's happening in terms of real money. But getting back to um, the CRB. So look at that move. From 2004 to 2008. I think we're going to see a move like that in commodities. It's a big, huge move. Now, look at what the inflation rates were during that time period, right? So from that's five years, and you can see that chart. That whole move happens during those five years. This, the, the inflation rates were 2.7%, 3.4%, 3.2%, 2.8%, That's it. Not a single year was anywhere near the Fed's a 2% target. Now, during those five years, the Fed raised interest rates 17 times, and 17 rate hikes didn't stop the commodity market from rising. The only thing that stopped it was the 2008 financial crisis. Now, unless you think we're going to have another financial crisis, which we could, it will be worse than the last one, how is Commodity prices are going to stop rising. How is gold going to stop rising if the Fed's going to start cutting? Because if we had this huge move in commodities and gold, at the same time, there were 17 rate hikes. What makes you think or anybody think that we're going to get rate cuts now and commodities are going to fall? No, the Fed would be throwing gasoline on the fire. So this is going to be an explosion across the board. Like the 1970s, all commodities, agriculture, industrial metals, you know, precious metals, energy, all this stuff is going way up. Now, how you can look at these commodity charts and, and think that inflation is going down. I mean, headline inflation is going to go through the roof uh, based on what's happening here. It's only a question of time before the dollar goes through the floor. That hasn't happened yet. The dollar was up a bit today. Um, and, and so that means gold was up even more in, in terms of other currencies. But the dollar didn't have a big rally. It did early on, but it, you know, it surrendered most of those gains it initially spiked on that BS uh, jobs report. But the mainstream media is still clueless. They don't want to question the Fed and this nonsense that inflation is coming down to 2%. So they see all this evidence that it's not. Soaring commodity prices are evidence that inflation is not coming down to 2%. I mean, these rising commodity prices aren't going to cause the inflation. They're going up because of inflation, right? Gold is going up because of inflation and because of rising inflation expectations that everybody is denying. And so to me, again, this is all like 2007, 2008, when after so many years of warning about a problem in the housing market and the subprime market, it finally blew up and the mainstream were still completely oblivious. They were still holding to this Goldilocks, 
Greatest story never told. Everything is great. No problems as far as the eye can see. Uh, uh, right up until the, the collapse of Lehman. This is the same thing. You know, we've had the equivalent of the subprime lenders going bankrupt and people thinking, don't worry about that. It's contained. You know? And I think the fact that we got this downgrade and at the same time, we got all these Bitcoin ETFs, right? Creating this huge distraction, right? This huge sideshow that's distracted people's attention from the center ring, right? They're all over there in, in Bitcoin uh, and they're missing out on gold. I mean, I feel bad for some of these people. They're going to lose a lot of money. I mean, some of you guys I don't feel bad for because you're arrogant and you deserve what you're going to get. But, you know, it'll be a good lesson. But there are a lot of good people, unfortunately, that just really, you know, drank the Kool-Aid. And, uh, you know, at least it's not you're not going to die. Right. It's not like Jim Jones that it's, you know, it's poison Kool-Aid. But financially, you're going to take a big hit. But more important, too, than the money people are going to lose in Bitcoin. The money they're not going to make in, in gold and silver. Because let's say gold and silver, you know, go up five, ten times. And your Bitcoin collapses. You don't just lose the money you put in Bitcoin. You lost all the money you would have made in gold and silver. And, of course, you could have bought mining stocks, which could go up even more. You know, people ask me, well, Peter, why don't you at least have, you know, a small percent of your, you know, put 1% in Bitcoin. I go, why? I don't want to throw away 1% of my money. <laughs> I, I'd rather throw an extra 1% in mining stocks, right? I mean, rather do that with it. Uh, then, then, then put it in a in a Bitcoin. Yeah. Now, do I wish I had bought Bitcoin years and years ago? Sure. Yeah. Bitcoin. If I'd have bought Bitcoin when I first learned about it, I'd have made more money in Bitcoin than anything else I bought. Obviously. Uh, but that doesn't mean I'm going to buy it now. <laughs> but it's funny when people try to claim, "Oh, Peter Schiff regrets not buying Bitcoin. He's changed his mind." I haven't changed my mind. <laughs> if I'd have bought it, I'd be selling it. Right. So, and the question is, had I bought it back then, how much would I still own right now? Uh, it's hard to say. But I mean, it seems like it's the perfect conditions, right? Wall Street hated it. You know, it was dead, you know, downgrades to these big, big mining stocks on the lows, ignoring gold going up above 2000. Everybody looking at fool's gold, Bitcoin, ETF, all this money, record amounts of money came in to these ETFs. I keep hearing people talking the most successful ETF launch ever. Yes, more money is going to be lost in these ETFs than any other ETFs in the history of ETFs. All this money that got in, it's never going to come out. It's going to money heaven. Who made the money? The people who were smart enough to sell their Bitcoin to these ETFs. And when I hear people talking about, well, BlackRock is buying Bitcoin. No, they're not. They're not buying it with their money. Their customers are buying it. They ain't buying it. They're not that dumb. They just created the ETF, uh, you know, because, you know, they, they want to make money off of their dumb customers. That, that's all they did. You got all these people trying to fleece their customers or taking advantage of their ignorance. But no, because they're buying it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's speculators are buying it. And soon they're going to be selling it. The problem is who's going to take the other side uh, of that trade? Anyway, I want to uh, mention, I'm going to do a, a Q&A after this, um, this podcast ends. So I'm sure people have questions to ask me. Um, and you, in order to ask the question, you got to be, you know, you got to sign up for locals. Um, but, you know. What's happened, as I said, this is very, very significant. I think enough has happened to now really de-risk my strategy. You know, nothing is, is riskless. But based on what the market is doing, if, if the gold is going to go up on news that normally makes it go down and go up even more, on news that makes it go up. Because when we get bad economic news, the Fed's going to cut. I mean, I think as long as we get these good numbers, I doubt they're going to cut. They're going to maintain the pretense that cuts are coming. But I think they'd be afraid. If they keep seeing um, gold oil going up and commodities going up and gold going up 
and all this evidence that inflation is going up, it's really hard to cut. So I think what they're going to do is keep talking about future cuts like they're coming. We just need to wait and see. You know, we need to make extra sure, you know, that inflation is down. Right. They're not going to admit that they realize it's going up. Right. Because they can't admit that. But I think they realize if they do cut rates, that's going to, you know, gold's going to explode higher. Right. Oil, every commodity. So they, they kind of want to, like, keep the rate cuts, you know, in their back pocket. But let everybody know that, that they're coming. Right. Because they can't undermine Wall Street. But if we start to see bad economic numbers from the perspective of the Biden administration, if we get to see some negative non-farm payroll reports, if we see a meaningful uptick in um, unemployment, or if we see some big banks blowing up, right? Because, you know, the longer they re refrain from cutting rates, the more pressure they put on these insolvent banks that hold all this underwater paper. So if something breaks in the economy, then the Fed's going to cut rates. And so any weak economic data that would indicate that the cuts are coming, that's going to be even more bullish for gold uh, because it's bullish even if they don't cut rates. But if they're forced to cut rates, that's even more bullish because that means real rates are going to fall even faster than they will if the Fed just stays pat. Uh, so based on that scenario, it's like, where's the downside? I don't see it. And these gold stocks are so cheap. These silver stocks, which, you know, silver stocks had big moves, you know, yesterday, today. But look where they are. You look at a long-term chart of these silver stocks, you can't even see the move over the last week or two. It, it's barely noticeable. That's how low these stocks still are. You know, and eventually Wall Street's going to figure this out. But anyway, I'm going to do uh, the, the, the podcast. I mean, I'm going to do the Q&A. After this podcast over, so you got time to uh, sign up because if you have any questions about this, you have any concerns, I mean, I'd like to, uh, you know, discuss those with anybody because I really think this is a, a big opportunity for people. And, you know, even if you have money in, 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 in U.S. stocks, there's no point at this point to be the U.S. market is so overpriced. I don't care if it keeps going up. It's going down in real terms. And the dollar is the next shoe to drop. The dollar hasn't cracked yet. That's coming. And, and that's going to really, I think, provide a big boost for the emerging market stocks, the other foreign stocks. And people just need to be invested. They need to be basically all in, I think, on this strategy. Um, because I, I, I think in my mind, we've de-risked it a lot. I think enough of the stuff has happened at this point. I don't think that people adopting my strategy are going to have to wait five years, you know, for it to play out or 10 years for it to play out. I think it's already playing out. It's just that most people don't get it, right? Because, you know, they don't know what to look for. That's why when the subprime lenders blew up, so many people on Wall Street just shrugged it off. They didn't realize what it meant. They didn't realize the significance like I did. I was waiting for that. I've been waiting for this moment. I've been telling everybody on the podcast, wait for the point where gold goes up on that strong economic data. Wait for gold to go up with interest rates. Right? I said all this stuff was going to happen. I just said, let's wait for it because that's going to be confirmation of what's going on. The only confirmation that we haven't had yet is the dollar. So we got bonds going down, uh, but not the dollar. But if treasuries keep falling, the dollar is going to go. Uh, and, and gold is rising. So two out of the three things are, are happening. But once we really start to see the dollar fall, that's going to accelerate the fall in bonds. It's going to accelerate the rise in gold, which is going to act like a vir virtual or vicious rather cycle. That's probably the better way to describe it because it's not good. I mean, it's good for my investment strategy, but it's not good for the U.S. or most, most American investors. But as inflation gets worse and the Fed doesn't hike rates, 
uh, that just accelerates it. And of course, the government is not going to do what it's supposed to do, which is cut spending. In fact, one of the other major mistakes that Powell and the Fed has made is their failure to criticize the government. Powell, you know, wants to pretend that, oh, I'm doing my job. I got to stay in my lane. I can't talk about fiscal policy. I just got to take it as I get it, right? Whatever they want to pitch me, I'm just going to swing at it, right? I don't care right, where that ball is. I'm just going to swing at what I get, right? That's a mistake. He's got the biggest podium out there to chastise the government and tell the government, look, you got to cut spending. You can't keep running these deficits. You're going to blow up the dollar. You're going to blow up the bond market. We're going to have runaway inflation. That's what Powell should be doing. He's got the bully pulpit as the Fed chairman. Instead, he is a wimp. He is afraid to speak up. So, oh, I can't talk. Go look at what Paul Volcker said. He yelled at Congress. He told these guys, you guys have got to cut this spending. Otherwise, we're in trouble. I can't do it just with rate hikes. Powell is afraid. He's afraid to hike rates, and he's afraid to criticize the politicians who won't cut spending, who are running these deficits. Look, here's Biden. He goes down to Baltimore, you know, where that big bridge collapsed. Oh, we'll pay for it. The government will just, federal government will come in. We'll cover those costs. With what money? Government is broke. They have to go borrow more money, cause more inflation. Right? We're sending more money uh, to the Ukraine. We have more government spending. Forgive more student loans. Right? We're doing the opposite of what we need to do. Powell should be criticizing every one of these uh, fiscal policy mistakes. But he doesn't do it. Oh, the Fed is independent. Yes, it's independent so it can criticize the government. That's the whole point of independence. See, he thinks it's a two-way street. He thinks because Congress is not supposed to criticize the Fed, the Fed is not supposed to criticize Congress. Look, anybody can criticize the Fed if they want. In fact, Paul Volcker, when he was criticizing Congress, Congress was criticizing him, right? He, you know, they liked him later on after inflation came down, but they were burning him in effigy you know, early on, right? They, they, they criticized him, but he stuck to his guns. Now, Ronald Reagan stuck by Volcker. Even as some of the senators and congressmen were critical, Reagan stuck by him. And that was one of the good things that, that Reagan did. But even if Reagan had, you know, had, had thrown him to the wolves, he would have stuck to his guns. But you can argue that the president or Congress shouldn't criticize the Fed, let the Fed be independent. But even if they do criticize the Fed, the Fed is supposed to say, who cares? Sticks and stones, right? Criticize me all you want. I'm doing what's right. So it doesn't matter. But what it doesn't mean, the independence of the Federal Reserve doesn't mean when Congress makes a mistake, when the president makes a mistake, and the chairman of the Federal Reserve knows it's a mistake, he doesn't just sit there silent. It's his job to criticize it because the average American doesn't know. He's supposed to be really smart, right? We're supposed to put real smart guys to head the Federal Reserve, smarter than the average truck driver or, you know, or waitress. So he needs to explain to that truck driver and that waitress what they're doing is wrong. They're going to destroy the value of your savings, of your paychecks. But no, he's afraid to do that. He won't criticize any policy because he doesn't want to upset any of the congressmen. Why not? If they're doing the wrong thing, what's what, what, what's more important? Right, Their feelings, right, their political career, or the country? So I think that's even a bigger mistake than not hiking rates, is not criticizing. The government. I think when historians look back at at, at Powell, that might be uh, what they think his biggest mistake was. And he, you know, it's going to be m all mistakes. I mean, yeah, he started raising rates too late, but then he he also stopped raising them too early. But the whole way, he sat there as these deficits ran out of control. In fact, one of the worst things Powell did 
during COVID, he encouraged the government to run bigger deficits. And he said, don't worry about the impact. I got your back. I'll print up all the money. I'll do all the QE you need. That was a huge mistake to have in, in, encouraged that, to have enticed the congressman into doing that. What he should have said is, look, you guys better not blow up these deficits during COVID because I ain't buying these bonds and interest rates are going to soar. That's what he should have said. He should have been independent, not cooperative, right? Let them know, hey, there's going to be consequences if you do this. Instead, he said, there's no consequences. Well, if there's no consequences, well, they're going to do it. They're going to hand out free money. They're going to buy votes if the Fed chairman says, go ahead and do it. Well, as I said earlier, back then, he was telling Congress, just run big deficits. I got your back. Well, now he's telling you, buy gold. I got your back, right? Buy silver. Get out of the dollar, right? You got nothing to fear from me, right, at the Fed. Um, and, and, and so listen to him, listen to me. And, um, you know, I know I was saying this, you know, I'm telling the last couple of weeks, just buy, just buy. And some people did. But a lot of people were like, ah, we'll see, we'll see. This, this, this is big. This, to me, looks different based on the way gold is acting, the way silver is now finally uh, waking up from its coma, uh, and, and, and the reaction that we're getting in the media and the professional investors. I mean, they're going to get in. Eventually, they're going to start talking about gold. It probably will be $3,000 an ounce before they start saying, oh, maybe you should buy it. Silver will clearly be back above 50. Uh, these gold stocks could be double or triple where they are. And they might start talking about it. But I think we still have a while uh, before the mainstream you know, actually puts its toe in the water. And then we'll get another short rally, bigger spike. And then maybe we'll get a correction. You know, We're not, we're not going to be without a correction. But I do think that the corrections will be pretty, pretty small, pretty shallow. Again, maybe a little bit deeper than what we've had when there's no real retail people around or no big money. I mean, wait till the pension funds get in. Wait till the endowments get in. Wait till more hedge funds get in. Because they're not. This is going to be a huge party, but right now nobody is there, right? It's so early, uh, but a lot more people are going to come. But the people who get in early, you know, people say, oh, you know, I, I, I should have bought Bitcoin earlier. People say, oh, we're at, this is the bottom of Bitcoin. You're not early. You are way late to the Bitcoin party if you're buying now. You are a bag holder. It is super early, even though in time, I've been in these gold stocks for more than a decade, two decades, actually. Um, I was super early. I mean, in fact, I got to the party before it even started, right? There weren't even, there was nobody there. They hadn't even opened the doors, right? That, you know, there was no band there. There was no, there was no food. There was no liquor. I, I was real early. So I had to wait it out, right? Waiting. Now the party's set up, right? You got, you got, you got the liquor, you got the music playing. Some pretty girls are there, you know, or guys, whatever. Um, so the party is starting, you know, to, to get fun, but there's very few people there, right? You got plenty of room. <laughs> so uh, more people are going to start to come in as they start to notice how much fun we're having at this party, right? We're making all, we're making all this money, I think. And uh, so that's going to make the party very interesting. And people who are at the Bitcoin party and that party goes sour, right? Basically, they're raided by the cops. The pretty girls have left to come to the gold party. Uh, they're going to want out. And even the people in the tech party, that's, that's going to poop. And they're, they're, they're going to want to uh, look for something. Like, you know, like at the, at the casino. You go to a casino and if one crap table, you get a, a hot shooter and he starts rolling numbers and people are making money and they're applauding. What happens? The people come to that table from the other tables. They want to be part of that action, right? Because they see, they hear what's going on. Well, that's going to happen. There's not that many of us at that gold party right now. So we're not making a lot of noise. <laughs> but it's going to get noisy and it's going to attract a lot more buying. I'm just trying to get my people in uh, as soon as possible. Um, and you know, I think the people that, that, that have been with me for many, many years, it's been a long wait. There's a lot of light at the end of this tunnel. And I think we're very close uh, to vindication. My guess would be by the end of this year, we could make up for all the underperformance relative to the S&P. And then 
going forward 2025, 2026, 2027, we're going to kick the crap out of the S&P in these resource stocks, mining stocks, foreign stocks, you know, just like these stocks did in the 1970s. Only I think this time the outperformance margin is going to be even higher. So anyway, I'm going to take about a 10 minute break and then I'm going to come back uh, and um, and start up uh, answering your questions. I'm sure people have a lot of questions now about what's going on. So you want to ask me these questions and I'll stick around and answer them uh, at, you know, Shift Radio Premium. Uh, so sign up. You got 10 minutes if you're not already signed up. If you're signed up, then, you know, you're ready to go. But anyway, that's it for now. If you like the podcast, give it the thumbs up. Put a comment on there. Let me know you like it. Let YouTube know you like it so the algorithm kicks in. I hope everybody has a great weekend. I think Sunday night could be another big one. So look out, and I'll be back again uh, with my next podcast next week. So take care, everybody. (music) 